Well, good morning, everyone. Hope you can see me. <laughs> I, <laughs> I usually need a soapbox. <laughs> um, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's not my first time, and I'm particularly delighted to be invited back by Bias Gaynor. Um, and I owe him another debt, uh, which is that in some of his uh, remarks that he made yesterday, his rather brief remarks, um, he gave me my text. Um, and it is uh, following some of the things that he said that I want to pursue, as, the, as Jonathan has just said, um, uh, tell you a little bit about uh, how I see the British experience on countering violent extremism, which of course is the subject of the next panel, um, in the UK context. Clearly, I'm going to be talking about a single nation's uh, experience, but I hope it's one uh, where um, there's going to be something of relevance to people from uh, other countries. Now, what Gaynor said, what Bob Bowers, Gaynor, uh, I'm sorry, Bowers said, he made, a, he made a, a couple of really central points about counterterrorism. And he said that it was indispensable to get three, the three essential elements of an effective counterterrorism policy, i.e. the military, the legal, and the psychological, into balance, and that we had to succeed in destroying the enemy's motivation to fight and not to allow ourselves, at the same time, to be shackled by lack of moral clarity in the name of the values of democracy. I think he's pretty spot on. You know, in formulating counterterrorism policy, it's admittedly pretty easy to go overboard in uh, handing draconian powers to the executive. But it's also easy, particularly in democracy, to be so mesmerized by the need to retain untouched the full panoply of civil and human rights that proportionality to the threat is distorted and capability is foregone. And so the story I want to tell this morning briefly is the UK's tussle with the question of proportionality and moral clarity, particularly in respect of the motivational aspects of the terrorist scene, that's to say uh, extremism. Um, before I do that, I just want to make one or two remarks about some of the things that I heard yesterday from other speakers about European policy. Um, there were several references, and if you don't mind me saying so, some of them implied, but some of them uh, pretty direct about the feebleness of Europeans. Well, you know, I can't speak for other Europeans, uh, but Britain is certainly European. But the notion that my country is pusillanimous or lacks determination in pursuit of our security goals is um, not something that I can accept. Uh, you heard yesterday, I think, in a speech of what I would describe as limpid clarity from Commander Walton, you know, the way in which uh, the UK has handled the terrorist threat with only one death in the last 10 years. And our uh, intelligence services have developed a high degree of professionalism. Uh, also, have our, so have our police. And the police are increasingly able to pull off the difficult combination of being simultaneously the investigators of crime and the recipients of valuable information from effective Muslim communities. That's not an easy balance to strike. And in relation to the major surge of refugees into Europe, uh, the UK, which is everyone I hope, or I would imagine knows, has not joined the Schengen Agreement on borders and has not given up control of national borders, intends to do the following, where uh, so as not to encourage further, further influxes into Europe, we're going to pursue a policy of taking people directly from the camps, and the Prime Minister said we will take about 20,000, and we will select those who are in greatest need, and that will be our criterion, uh, and we will also have an eye to security considerations. Now, we're going to remain in control of the people we admit to our country, and we are alive to the dangers of importing uh, by that way a fifth column. The other thing, of course, that the UK has done over the years is to amend in important ways uh, the way in which we tackle conspiracy to commit terrorism instead of waiting for its commission before we bring the law into play. No, and that has involved tightening the law. We've done such things as barring preachers of violence from the country and hate speech within it. And we've taken powers of executive detention 
to be applied in cases where there is good intelligence of the intention to engage in terrorist activity, which, however, is of a nature that cannot be brought before a court of law. And there must be many in the audience who are aware and familiar with that situation. It's a power which is under uh, tight legal supervision. Nevertheless, I would say that's a fairly drastic thing for a country committed over the centuries to the rule of law to have to do. And I am glad to say that you know, we have only a penny number of people who are actually involved in its implementation. But you know, it's not a pleasant thing or a matter of, of uh, joy uh, that we have, have been obliged, as we see it, to, con con to curb the outer edges of free speech and freedom of association but life is full of difficult trade-offs. I could go on on the things we've done. My point, my point is that the UK has pursued its security goals over a considerable period of time on a wide canvas, which I have to say is getting wider still, and I'll come to that in a minute, without great drama and in a proportionate way, and with, I think, pretty commendable results. We've also tried to maintain balance one of uh, Bowers's other points. The UK has been prominent in the military fight against terrorism, and I hope that the House of Commons will soon rectify the glitch of last year concerning military action over Syria. I'm not uh, entirely confident we will, because recent developments in the Labour Party are not promising in that respect. So we're not perfect. And we are far from having solved all our problems. I've said that you know, we, we've acted without dramas, and I think that's true, but it does not mean, it does not mean that there hasn't been a very great deal of argument. And in areas which involve what goes on in the minds of men, and indeed these days in the minds of women, uh, th this sort of area has been amongst the most controversial. Anybody who's witnessed the uh, continuing arguments in the British Parliament about the right of access of extremist preachers to university campuses, which are well-known recruiting grounds for terrorism, and the opposition of many academics and others to taking any responsibility even to monitor what goes on, couldn't fail to be aware of the kind of continuing controversy that we face and the whole question of the tussle with moral clarity. I think the UK understood right from the outset of modern international terrorism that we were dealing with an ideological issue. And the four-pronged counter-terrorism strategy which we, caused, uh, we brought into being had as one of its original components a strand called prevent. And there will be people in the audience who are familiar with this. Now, as it name, its name implies, uh, this involves getting in before the act. <coughs> The government has funded and developed both prevention of radicalization and de-radicalization policies with, however, what I would describe as, at best, limited results. Over 600 Britons have gone to Syria to fight, not as many as some other European countries, but still a sizable number which we must bring down. The problem is that the motivating ideology is becoming more, more, not less prom a prominent component of terrorism. Al-Qaeda's style command and control is not non-existent in terrorism, but it now plays a much less frequent part of the terrorist scene, at least in, in Europe. And its place has been taken by individuals inspired by extremist ideology to take the initiative themselves in developing a local plot. Now, some of this is Daesh uh, inspired, but not all. And as we know, small-scale roaming acts of terrorism can take a lot of lives and cause almost as much fear as something significantly bigger. And it has the element of unpredictability in it. Typically, the conspirators and the conspiracy will itself, because of its light organization, have a very light electronic footprint, if, if indeed it has one at all to detect. And the perpetrators may also have very light profiles in the files of the intelligence services, if they have one at all. Let me give you another example of the problems faced by the intelligence services. A specialty of Daesh is one-to-one -one recruitment 
via social media of impressionable young people to come to fight. Now, I might say the recruitment age of terrorists has gone down by almost 10 years, and some people you know, in their very early teens are, in, are now the targets of this activity. And the motivating element is ideological. Now, for some of it, is the, it's the thrill of the brutal scenes that they are shown, and for others, often the women, it's a vision of a false and but alluring utopia. Um, all of that, you know, in the minds of those who are having these thoughts implanted in them, unconnected to wider realities. The intelligence services are going to find it increasingly difficult in this world of multiple microscopic activity to track the threats they represent by the technical means at their disposals. I have to say that I think that the present attitude of, of social media owners who are mostly uh, offshore and mostly American, who could do a great deal more to help in this difficult task, is only one as I can describe as I want to use the word deplorable, it's certainly extraordinarily unhelpful. And I don't accept that the First Amendment really stands in the way. Uh, it's been correctly observed. And we, d we do need, we do very much need uh, the help uh, of those owners to uh, bring down accounts, uh, to warn, to present uh, information to, to the intelligence services of impending activity. It's a very, very, become a very important part of the scene. It's also been uh, correctly observed that human intelligence is once again assuming a greater role. And I think that's uh, true. It also points to the importance of good community policing and the links with the, with the families involved. But getting at the ideological side of things, I, I would maintain, is now not just an important add-on to successful counterterrorism, but central, central to long-term durable solutions. So what, you may ask, stands in the way of the UK acting rapidly and effectively on such a perception? Well, I would say that we've got four factors uh, which, which are obstacles and over which uh, there continues to be uh, either confusion or disagreement uh, or just um, unwillingness to act. And the consequence of all of this is, uh, in some instances, pretty ineffective action which increasingly, you know, is increasingly urgent. So what are these? Well, first of all, I think there is the confusion and disagreement over the target of policy. Is it just violent extremism or is it extremism per se? Secondly, depending on the answer to that question and whether indeed we can agree on the answer to that question, uh, where do the limits to legitimate action lie in countering extremism? Thirdly, uh, is it only the behavior of the members of the community uh, from which the dissenting behavior springs who should have to change their ways? Or is it the wider community as a whole? And fourth, whose responsibility is all of this? No, who should take the lead? Now we've been coming, uh, we've become accustomed to looking to the intelligence services for answers to terrorist problems, or if not them, the police. And they certainly have a role here, especially the police. But in my view, the time has come to look to wider factors in society. And I want to make just a brief comment on the four factors before I wrap up. First of all, what's the issue? In its first iteration of PREVENT, the then Labour government of the day took the view that violence was the issue. The even funded Salafists, who were actively engaged in promoting a separate and segregated way of life, albeit nonviolent, as agents in the prevention of radicalization and de radicalization. Now, we conservatives most certainly did not agree. And today, only those who share and promote democratic values are funded by the government in this work. We take the view that people do not become radicalized or violent from a standing start, and that there is a pathway to violence through extremism 
including non-violent extremism. I think it's true to say that most people in the UK, though still not all, now accept this thesis and its consequences. Uh, the problem is finding the numbers needed in the Muslim community to engage in this work. The most powerful testimony without doubt, especially when dealing with victims of Daesh and blandishments, comes from disillusioned ex-jihadis. The issue of the boundaries of legitimate action and of its accountability, my second factor, has been a source of argument from the outset. It's hardly surprising in a democracy, and there's no change here. So far, disagreement has been fought out largely over the powers of the police and the criminal justice system. But this autumn, the government will face a prolonged, I have no doubt it will be, prolonged and fiercely contested battle to get its legislation through Parliament to update the technical capabilities of the intelligence agencies and to authorize bulk collection of data, which, of course, gets us right into the privacy debate. And there are new dangers involved. The canard springing from Edward Snowden's damaging activities, that bulk collection equals bulk surveillance by government, which is assiduously peddled by those who should know better, it has had the effect of souring the atmosphere and, and introduced a level of distrust not hitherto seen in the public debate in the UK. And I am very worried about this. Um, I think it is fair to say that the stoical ability of the population at large to carry on after an atrocity is rooted in what has hitherto been a high level of trust between people and government. This is a very precious asset, and it is essential, uh, and I think it is, uh, as it is essential, that the government gets its bill, because I do not see how we will ever get our targets if we can't collect information. Uh, the government needs both to make its case more vigorously to the public and to offer more procedural safeguards in the legislation than it's hitherto seen fit to do. I think this is a, going to be a battle royal, and it's a very, very, going to be a very important one, because it, of course, goes to the kernel of capability. The third and fourth factors, and I'm coming to an end, uh, who should be changing behavior and who should be leading that change, they're both they're closely related. Internal disagreements in the unlamented coalition government, which stifled action, meant that a vital part of that government's original intentions, the active integration of recently arrived minority communities, above all the Muslim communities, got nowhere. There were endless arguments, I recall them being in the government, there were endless arguments within the government about who should do what where, with the result that nobody did very much at all anywhere. Uh, I think the recent revelation of the existence in schools of staff and governors <coughs> who are promoting a separate and segregated way of life among pupils, and the ethics of which were amazingly, I might say amazingly, ignored by the school's inspectorate, plus the recruitment activities of Daesh, have bounced the current government into renewed action. And what emerges from the Prime Minister's speech, David Cameron's speech of 20 July, is the realization that successful prevent policy has to be supported by much greater efforts at bringing about social cohesion. And that desired level of integration will never be achieved by relying on the cozy notion that the to tolerant and welcoming society that is written in that society, immigrants will automatically imbibe our values and settle down without any effort on our part. No, tolerance is not just a passive thing. It might have worked, that attitude might have worked in the 19th century, but there are far too many hostile outside influences making an impact to the contrary for that to be a safe bet these days. I might say in the UK we don't expect assimilation, nor, nor, however, are we on a multicultural path. And I would like to correct the assertion made yesterday by one of the speakers that Mr. Cameron promotes multiculturalism. He does not the simple reason that he doesn't think it's desirable. And you won't find that word in any of his speeches. Multiracial, multi-faith, indeed, and both are facts of our society. 
And the vision is there. It is of an open, diverse, and upwardly mobile democracy whose inhabitants share, and this is the point, the same values and way of life. So now we have an A to B question. How do we get from where we are to where we need to be? It does mean structural change, reducing the cultural isolation of communities living apart and being educated separately because of historical housing patterns. It involves paying attention to the ethic and governance of schools. It implies fostering ambition to climb the ladder. Muslims are behind Hindus, Chinese, and many, many other immigrants, Im immigrant groups in the UK. Uh, and among the population as a whole, we, ought to have, we need to foster a stronger sense of the meaning and attributes of citizenship. The changes that are needed are myriad. I could you know, go on, but I certainly will not. And they run right across government and also society. I've not mentioned right-wing extremism in the UK, which I, ma I imagine the panel may well talk about. Uh, not because it's not uh, important, um, it's just a time constraint, but uh, in promoting opportunity to minority communities, there is an important thing that we must bear in mind, and that's not to ignore the needs of lagging white communities. You know, the UK Independence Party, UKIP, already feeds on feelings of resentment about displacement, uh, and these sentiments can easily turn ugly and violent against minorities. Uh, I don't need to spell out the argument there, I'm sure. Lastly, of course, the willing participation of Muslim communities is essential. Ten years ago, the Muslim Council of Britain, which was a largely self-appointed group, which claimed to speak for Muslims in Britain, was promoting an agenda of all Muslim schools, halal food in other schools, Sharia courts, and so on. Many Muslims were sending money abroad to finance terrorism, through traditional charitable channels, and some of them were doing it unwittingly, and some certainly not. And it would be far too much to say that none of this occurs now, but there is less of it. And I think there are many and more varied voices taking on leadership roles and talking the language of shared destiny. Daesh recruitment of teenagers has jolted Muslim parents out of complacency, and there is, I think, a dawning realization that here, is a common enemy that can only be defeated by coming and acting together. So out of good, out of bad, may come some good. I don't want to sound over-optimistic. I think there is a glimmer of hope there, but we certainly have to open up and expand it. So to sum up, I think that in the UK, we're at least engaging in uh, a complete agenda on the right one and the real issues. And we should get credit, I think, for relevance. Uh, destroying the enemy's motivation to fight, to go back to Bowers' point, has at least to start with trying to destroy his ability to recruit, and we are trying. Displaying moral clarity, his other point, involves being prepared to break the eggs to make the omelette, and not imagining that we can have it without doing so. And there, I might say, I think we are still on test. We must be prepared to have tough debate. We are having tough debate, but we must be willing to take tough decisions. And in the UK, the battle in the, uh, against extremism is work in progress. Thank you very much.